we now go back to 4.2. It's called the mean value theorem. So I have no idea why the author orders some of these sections the way that he does. Uh, 4.2, yeah, there's a connection to 4.1 for sure. Um, but to put 4.2 between, you know, 4.1 and 4.3, um, in, you know, in this way, the mean value theorem between those ideas, uh, I don't understand that at all. So here it is. What is the mean value theorem? Um, well, in order to get there, we need another theorem first uh, called Rolle's theorem, R-O-L-L-E, Rolle's theorem. Okay, this is going to help us out. So what is Rolle's theorem? Let me just show you the whole thing. And, oh, man, that seems like a lot. Let's talk through it. If f of x satisfies the three hypotheses, and here they are. Hypothesis number one, f of x is continuous on an interval from a to b. Number two, f of x is differentiable on a, b, meaning that the derivative exists everywhere between a and b. And finally, number three, that f of a is equal to f of b. So in other words, the y values of the endpoints are the same. If all three of those things are true, then we can conclude there exists c in a, b, such that f prime of c equals zero. Okay, so before we get to any examples using this, I'm um, going to give you some pictures and just kind of talk you through it. Um, this is another theorem that, you know, if any one of us lived back in those days when calculus was being developed, you know, we would stop and say, well, of course, like, ah, couldn't it be my name on that theorem instead of roll? to remembered for, be remembered for hundreds of years. Okay, so let's take a look. Here is one drawing. I'm going to give you another one. But let's just look at this one first. So um, all I've done is, you know, create a little XY plane and then mark an A, mark a B. And we notice hypothesis three, that the Y values there are the same. So I'm going to draw a function connecting these two points such that it's continuous and differentiable. Um, so it's just, just this curve is going to go through them. So you're right, we could just draw a straight line, you know, anything like that. I'm just going to draw something real simple. You know, maybe it like comes up and kind of comes back down. And the peak of that is actually a little bit off center. I kind of like this drawing for this particular, to depict what we need to depict. Okay, so I've got a function that's continuous. It's differentiable, right? There's no cusp. Uh, there's no jumps. Obviously, if it's continuous, there's no jumps, but um, no uh, horizontal. Um, yeah, the derivative always exists. No vertical tangent lines. That's what I meant to say. Okay. So is the conclusion really true? Does there exist C somewhere between A and B such that the derivative equals zero? You're like, yeah, of course, right, right up there at the top. That would be a horizontal tangent line. So wherever that occurs, that's C. Okay. A duh, of course, there has to be. Let me give you another drawing that takes it We'll take it to another level here. So again, I've got A and B, and their Y values are the same. Let's go do something a little bit more complicated than just one up and down. So maybe maybe it comes down, and then it goes up, and then it comes down again, and then back. So it still has to be continuous and differentiable. So there's no cusps, no holes, no jumps, no vertical asymptotes, that sort of thing. Hmm, okay. Well, let's see. Does there exist a C between A and B where the derivative would equal zero? And yeah, actually, you'd think, well, there's three times that happens. Here, 
here and here. So you might even call those like C1, C2, and C3. Okay, so Rolle's theorem guarantees there's at least one. It says there exists C between A and B. What happens? So in other words, it's at least got to happen once. But it might happen multiple times depending on what the function is. Okay. So what are examples going to look like? Your most basic examples are going to say this. Check the three hypotheses of Rolle's theorem. If f of x on the interval from a to b satisfies the theorem, then find all c values where f prime of c equals 0. So we're going to go through, we're going to be given a function and an interval, and we're just going to confirm that those three hypotheses are true. And then we're, once we confirm that, if it's true, then we're going to go on and find those c values. OK. We're going to do a couple of these. Let's look at f of x equals x to the third plus 2x squared minus x plus 3. And the interval is from negative 2 to 1. OK. So we'll begin by checking the hypotheses. First hypothesis is, for that function, is it continuous on negative 2 to 1? So in this case, right, we're just going to look at the function x to the third plus 2x squared minus x plus 3. And we're just going to think. There's nothing to compute or calculate. We're just going to think, hey, are there any discontinuities between negative 2 and 1, right? Are we ever dividing by 0? Um, are there any vertical asymptotes? Are there any holes, any jumps? And there's not, right? If there's a question about that sort of thing that we want to look further, but here there's no question, there's no jump, there's no hole, there's no vertical asymptote. Yes, we are continuous. Okay. Hypothesis number two. Is f of x differentiable on that interval from negative 2 to 1? Now here there is something for us to do as we're talking about the derivative. So let's take the derivative. Right here, f prime of x equals 3x squared plus 4x minus 1. And that's nice because then we can look at the derivative and say, OK, does the derivative always exist between negative 2 and 1? And again, we're thinking, well, do we ever end up dividing by 0 for any values in between here? You know, anything like that going on. And no, we don't. So yes, we're differentiable. One thing you may have noticed even back in the theorem was that for the continuous, we use these closed brackets. We call that a closed interval, if we contain the endpoints. Where differentiable, we have an open interval, where we don't include the endpoints. That's really not significant for the problems that we're going to look at. Um, but, you know, it is definitely something we notice. So what does that mean? We have to be continuous at the endpoints themselves. But we don't have to be differentiable on the endpoints themselves. So if it came out that it was not differentiable at 1, we wouldn't care. Because it's only the values between. But if it was not continuous at 1, then that's another story and it would fail that hypothesis. Again, it's really... Uh, it's not going to be an issue for any of the problems that we're going to see, but it is something to, that, we, that we can note. All right, we got two down. What's that third hypothesis? Let's just roll this up now. Do the y values of the endpoints, are they the same? Does f of negative 2 really equal f of 1, right? The y values of our endpoints of our interval. Well, let's just calculate both of them, see if we get the same thing. So f of negative 2, right? Put negative 2 back in here. Boom, boom, boom. I invite you to crunch these numbers along with me and verify that you get 5. 
So over here at negative 2, we've got y equals 5. How about at 1? And this one's a little bit easier, right? 1 plus 2 minus 1 plus 3 would be 5 as well. And yep, they both came out to be 5. Now we definitely had to do that work on the side, right? So that works. So all three hypotheses check out. Okay, if all three hypotheses check out, then the conclusion must follow. But I think, let's say, part of that question was checked hypotheses if it satisfies the theorem. So it satisfies Rolle's theorem. So if it satisfies, then that means the conclusion of Rolle's theorem um, is has to be true as well. So we can find the values of C where F prime of C equals zero. How are we going to do that? Well, take your derivative that you found just a moment ago, set it equal to zero, and go about solving. Now, we're going to solve for x. So oftentimes, these things get phrased as find the c values. But we can just solve for x. That, that's The c values are x values, right? OK, so it turns out here, 3x squared plus 6x minus 1 equals 0. Um, that's not factorable. So we got to use the quadratic formula. Everybody's favorite. x equals negative b plus or minus square root b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Maybe you know the song. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this. I trust that we've done quadratic formula a couple times, I think. I trust that you guys can execute this, and I'm just going to reveal um, all the way down to the end, and let me speak about just what I've got here on the side, but, you know, if you just kind of want to crunch those numbers along with me. Oh, and I think I made a mistake. Oh my gosh, a terrible mistake. Okay, wow, good thing I looked back at this. Okay, so we got the negative 6. Here, we can divide everything by 2. So that should have been negative 3 and 3. I, mean, I think I'm not sure what I was thinking there. Negative 3 plus or minus square root of 7 over 3, dividing them all by 2. Okay. Now, the truth is this is really two different values, right, because of the plus or minus. So the C values that we're looking for, the X values, they always fall in the interval, somewhere between negative 2 and 1. So we want to look, okay, we know at least one value falls between negative 2 and 1, but maybe both of them do. So just do a quick check in your calculator. What are these really? So if we take, you know, negative 3 plus square root of 7... I don't need that. And then divided by 3. And, well, my calculator is doing this. So I've got this little double arrow. If you've got a similar calculator to mine and it won't convert to a decimal, this button here has a double arrow, converts fractions to decimals. And so you can use that to get the fractional version. Hey, negative 0.118. Yeah, that's between negative 2 and 1. Okay. So adding, adding square root 7 worked. How about subtracting square root 7? Divided by 3, and it's going to do it again. So I'm going to hit the double arrow. Uh, negative 1.882. Yep, that's between negative 2 and 1 as well. So both of these turned out to be between negative 2 and 1. So they're both um, C values that I want to consider as my answer where the derivative was equal to 0. Let's look at one more example. Part B. We've got f of x. It's a piecewise 1 plus x when x is less than 0 and 1 minus x when x is greater than or equal to 0. And the interval is from negative 3 to 3. OK. Well, 
we're just gonna um, you know same same kind of problem we're gonna look at the three hypotheses starting with number one is f of x continuous on that interval from negative three to three hmm okay now this one is is not so obvious we can't just look at it and check it we we have something to show because we have a piecewise function the moment of transition is questionable. Now, if you think, hey, 1 plus x, yeah, that's continuous, no problem. 1 minus x, that's continuous. But at the moment that transition happens, there could have been a jump. So we need to look further at x equals 0. How are we going to do that? We need to take the limit from the left. We need to take the limit from the right. And we also need to think about the function value at 0 itself. Is it really continuous there? So let's do all that. I'm just going to show you both my limits here. So the limit from the left, you know, we take the 1 plus x, and that's going to turn out to be 1. The limit as we approach 0 from the right, we take the 1 minus x. And plugging in, we get 1 as well. So, okay, perfect. We know that the two-sided limit for the function does exist, and it equals 1. So there's not a jump at 0. However, just because there's not a jump doesn't mean it's continuous. It might be a removable discontinuity. So let's check f of 0 itself. f of 0, well... We take the part where it could equal 0, so we take that one. We plug in 1 minus 0. Hey, that's 1. And now these two are the same. So yes, it is continuous. Both the left and the right side are approaching 1, and the function value is there as well. So everything's fine, and it's continuous. Okay. Okay. Quite a bit of work just to show that. Hmm, all right, moving on. Hypothesis number two. Is it differentiable? Okay, so it turns out the answer to this is no. Uh, that f prime of zero, even though it's continuous there, that questionable moment at zero the derivative does not exist. The best way to explain this is with a graph. If you were to graph that piecewise function, you would get this. So there's this line here, right? It's, it's 1 plus x this way. So it's got a y-intercept of 1 and a slope of 1 coming up. Then it turns into 1 minus x or maybe you want to think of it as negative x plus 1. So it's got that y-intercept of 1, but now the slope is negative 1. And I've indicated where negative 3 and positive 3 occur, just because that's the interval we're, we're looking at. So it is continuous there at 0, but there's a cusp, right? And so it's not differentiable. Um, across the entire interval. At that one moment, um, it fails, this hypothesis, if you will. So we're just going to say it does not satisfy Rolle's theorem because we didn't meet all the hypotheses. Um, and we can just stop right there. Um, and the logic, kind of the if-then nature of these theorems and the way this works if it doesn't satisfy all three hypotheses, then the conclusion of the theorem is not guaranteed. And it's definitely the case here, right? Is there any moment between negative 3 and 3 where the derivative is equal to 0? No. Because the one moment where we've got the maximum, the local max, um, it's a cusp and the derivative does not exist. So, no, um, it, it doesn't happen. Now, you know, but it turns out if we look further, um, the y values of the endpoints are the same. So it, uh, step number three, or hypothesis number three, would have worked out. But because of that um, non-differentiability, if you will, of x equals zero, we can't guarantee the conclusion. Okay, let's stop here. 
and more to come. Mean Value Theorem next.